Let the court reporter hold on to the um, defendant's cell phone overnight, um, and that's one of the exhibits that we intend to offer this morning along with a few others uh, at this point. Okay. So I can go through each one if you'd like at this point. Which number is the cell phone? So the cell phone's going to be states 311 311. And you're offering that for record purposes, I presume? Actually, we're offering it for all purposes, all Judge. Purposes. Yes, Your Honor. Do you have any objections, Mr. Brown? No objection to the phone. Uh, it will be admitted for all purposes. That states 311. The next three are going to be 304, 305, and 306. Did you have any objections to 304, 305, and 306? Just for the record, these are the search warrants associated with the defendant's cell phone. Are you offering these for all purposes? For record purposes. All right. No, no objection for record purposes. They're each admitted for record purposes. 304, 305, and 306. The next one, Your Honor, is states exhibit 290. What is 290? 290 is going to be the cell phone extraction. The full extraction, we're only offering this for record purposes. No objection for record purposes. It is admitted for record purposes. <laughs> the next three I'm ready. Okay. It's going to be states two eighty eight, two eighty nine, and two ninety four. Two eighty eight, two eighty nine, and two ninety four. Yes, Your Honor, and those are the Verizon subscriber records. For the defendant's phone, um, for uh, both of John's phone, and also 294 is just going to be a printout of the respective phones and phone numbers, uh, the owners of those phones that are contained within states 289. And for what purposes are you offering those? For all purposes, Your Honor. These are also under business record affidavit. No objection to 294. It's admitted for all purposes. Brian, does 288 have anything on it beyond the subscriber biographical information? Does it have data that shows substantive? text or things like that. It does. So just for a portion of uh, September the 6th. We uh, we don't object to the information that shows the subscriber biographical information. We just object to any substantive information that is not relevant. Uh, and for which purpose are you offering 288? For all purposes, Your Honor. And is it on a disc? It or is. Have you had an opportunity to look at the disc? I've, I've seen the, the records. Uh, yeah. What time frame is covered on Exhibit 288? Okay. 288 is going to be the historical cell phone data with location information for the defendant's cell phone. What time? I understand that, uh, but what time frame? From for, for the duration of her phone, since she's been with Verizon. I don't have the exact date, but it goes back a long time. So, there is only a slight portion of that that might be relevant for purposes of this trial. And you, do, you have a copy of that CD, and you've had a chance to go through? Yes, ma'am. And how long? Did she have this phone? Um, two or three years, I believe. So, you want to admit two or three years of data? We're offering for all purposes, Your Honor. The, the only thing that we're pulling from that and using from that to corroborate other information that we have 
uh, is location data for the six um, that corroborates what we've, what, what evidence and testimony we've, we've proffered and intend to proffer about her location. Um, also, there is, no, that's it for 288. Judge, we're not arguing about where she was or the location on September 6th, so if this can be limited then to September 6th, then to September 6th. I mean, we don't have any objection to that, Judge, but we don't have any way without kind of breaking um, the how it was transmitted to us. I will represent to the court as an officer of the court our only interest, the only publication would be for September the 6th. Uh, but there's just no way for me to go into the records and change what they sent. So we offer it for all purposes. Um, if you want, I guess we could get a protective order on everything beyond the 6th. Um, I can tell you I will not have, I have no interest in anything before the 6th. <laughs> Well, the only relevant, I will admit it, but the only relevant data that you'll be able to display will be that of September the 6th, 2018. I understand. Do you have any further objections, Mr. Brown? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brown, you're going to have to come back up and answer the question. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Yes, Your Honor. 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 Yes, 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 2018. And also, we also um, got Verizon records for both of them under another subpoena. That states 289. This has both of theirs. Um, Verizon records. They shared a carrier. And so we have both of them on 289. I think the objection, or you had an issue with, there were some text messages that are contained. Right. Um, on, um, that's actually 288. You're okay with that, though? Well, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I want to uh, not waive any objections that I've had to the text messages on September 6th that the judge has already allowed in. So I don't want to, I have the same objections on those. Uh, but then my objection that I think we're all understand is all the two to three years is, is not relevant for any purpose. And the same for 289. We will or uh, indicate to the court that we're not looking at anything past the six. And, and so, Judge, just my objection is the prior data prior to September 6th is not relevant. And then I have the same objections for any substance of text messages on September 6th. They're just limited on that. If you, you've already let those in, but I'm, I want to. You still have your objections. My same objections to those. And I have my same rule. Thank you, Judge. And when it comes to. 289, you said that both Ms. Geiger's and Mr. John's uh, data are contained within that one disk. That's right. And I will allow the admission of that disk, but I'm going to limit the purposes to September 6th of 2018. Very good. you want to show the location of each person. Very good, John. And finally, whenever you're ready, we have ready. Uh, States Exhibit 285 and 293. What is 285? So this is going to be a printout of records contained in 293. They, these are, um, this is data that was pulled from uh, Botham's car um, that shows GPS data and whereabouts that's collected by the car uh, as, as a matter of, of Ford's infotainment system. Did you have any objections? No objection. Except me. And we'd offer that for all purposes, Your Honor. So that was 285. And 293. And 293. As well. Thank you, Your Honor. And finally, just for the record, um, I know the court has signed an order uh, authorizing the state to turn over criminal histories for the witnesses and just want the record to reflect that the state has done so. And you acknowledge the receipt of those, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else? I trust you all had a good night's rest and are ready to proceed.
Mr. Hermes. Your Honor, I call Carla Rivera. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please make yourself comfortable. Good morning, Ms. Rivera. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Would you go ahead and state your full name uh, and spell your name for the court's report, please? It's Carla Denise Rivera, uh, maiden name Baruman. It's K-A-R-L-A. Denise, D-E-N-I-S-E, -E. Rivera, R-I-V-E-R-A, Baruman is B-E-R-U-M-E-N. Well, that's a lot of testimony <laughs> just to get that. <laughs> you ready to go forward now? Yes. Good. What do you do for a living? I am a 911 call taker okay. for the Dallas. You, oh, I'm sorry. For the Dallas Police. How long have you done that? Uh, a year and a half. It's about to be two in December. Okay. You like it? Yes. I imagine it's very exciting work. Yes, every day is different. Okay, do you work days, evenings, afternoons? I work third watch, which is uh, 3 to 11, 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Would you give the ladies and gentlemen of the jury an idea of what a 911 operator does in a big city like Dallas? Um, we handle all no emergency calls. Um, pretty much that's not health related. Anything that get, like that goes to DFR. Um, we get any type of 911 emergency calls. Um, we pretty much um, answer the calls, we enter all the, gather all information that, as much possible as we can so we can give it to dispatcher. Um, dispatcher then um, assigns officers and dispatches the call. So if I need police help or emergency services help, you're the person who may answer me on the other line? Yes. Well, thank you very much for what you did. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you a, quest, a question just as a matter of logistics. Uh, do you talk with a lot of police officers throughout the day over the radio as well? No. Okay, is that another branch? <coughs> That's right. dispatch. Okay. Yes. All right, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. All right, Ms. Rivera, I'm going to ask you <coughs> first if you recognize State's Exhibit Number 4. This is going to be a business records affidavit. Is that signed by you? Yes. All right, and were you authenticating this CD? which is the 911 call that was received on September the 6th, 2018. Yes. Okay. And you had an opportunity to hear this call before, is that right? Yes. And is that call, uh, a re when someone calls 911 and you're put onto the phone with the person making the call, is that entire call recorded? Yes. When you heard this, did you recognize your voice on it? Yes. And did the person who was calling in identify themselves as Amber Geiger? Yes. Did you make any additions, deletions, or any kind of edits to this recording whatsoever? No. Your Honor, I'm going to offer State's Exhibit Number 4. It's been under business records affidavit since May 7th of 2019. And I believe it's also the product of a stipulation. Okay. And Ms. Rivera, while I'm up here, are you familiar with these records called the Incident Detail Report uh, generated by the Dallas Police Department when 911 calls are, are dispatched? Yes. All right. And uh, does it contain certain uh, documented computer timestamps for various critical events? Yes. All right. And are these documents relied upon in your business? So say, for example, you were to get in trouble because you took so long to dispatch a call or an officer took so long to, to respond to a call. Are these the records that would be pulled to actually verify the times that actually occurred? Yes. All right. I'm going to offer State's Exhibit Number 5. Uh, for all purposes, also under business records affidavit since May 7, 2019. Sure. Your Honor, this is State's Exhibit Number 5. No Yellow sticky will be removed, Judge. Okay, let's start with State's Exhibit Number 5. On this particular occasion, when a telephone dials 911, Obviously, the telephone is activated before, especially if it's a cellular phone, before it actually is received by your police department, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. But when your police department received the 911 call that we're going to play for the jury in a moment, uh, can you tell the jury what time that phone call came in? 21.59 with 10 seconds. All right, so that's going to be in, in that's military time. In regular time, that's 9.59.10. Yes. Okay. 
and did officers immediately get dispatched to that particular call? Um, it gets sent to dispatch, okay. which we call phase to call. That way um, it starts the process of getting officers dispatched as well as EMS. Okay. And so does this indicate that the first officers were dispatched at 2246? Yes. Okay. So that's going to be about a minute and 36 seconds later. Yes. All right. And does this indicate that the first officers arrived on the scene of the Southside Flats at 220118? Yes. That's going to be 100118. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. You okay? <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're talking about a response time of about two minutes after the call, after the phone at DPD rings until the first officer arrives, we're talking about two minutes. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may I publish the 911 call at this time? Yes. And Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes, I'd like to offer State's Exhibit Number 4A. It's going to be a transcript of the 911 call already in evidence. I'd like to hand one out to each of the jurors so they can follow along if they wish or if not. Okay. May I hand these to the jurors, Your Honor? Yes, please. Okay. I know. I know. Is it big one? Oh, fuck. They're almost there. They're already there. They're cutting 
get to you. I thought it was my apartment. I thought it was my apartment. Holy fuck. I thought it was my apartment. Oh my god. Yes. Is that why you said you deal with the police Go officers? Ahead. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And then the, the communication between you and Ms. Geiger, uh, Geiger came to an end? Yes. Okay. And just, I think it's just coincidentally, but right before you yesterday was another witness by the, the last name, Rivera. You're not like sister or any relation with him, right? No. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to pass you to the defense, okay? All right. Hi, Ms. Rivera, Robert Rogers. I just have a few questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. When a when you get a call that comes in, then you're uh, you're communicating with police and fire. Are those separate places? How do you communicate with, with each entity? It, they're both in the same call sheet. Um, once you call phase it, um, they both get sent one to the EMS and one to dispatch, police dispatch. And, and as soon as you're getting the call, you're typing in information that's going to each entity, correct? Yes. And then uh, you're, the, you're expecting each, each to respond. And she, if she makes it clear she needs police and EMS, correct? Yes. And uh, there were some issues. You're, you're, you're going to be on the phone until one of those entities gets there, is that correct? Because you, you want to make sure that the loop is closed, that, that help is called for, and that help arrives, correct? Yes. And so you're trying to gain information, and there was some, you know, obviously the, there was some confusion trying to get the officers to her location, correct? Yes. Um, and so uh, the officers were on scene, and there was some some time that passed that you're you're getting information that the officers are on scene, and you're con you're relaying that to uh, to Miss Geiger. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and then um, eventually we hear you know the, the she says over here, over here, and the officers are arrive on scene, and then your your loop is closed. You let the police and EMS take over from there. Correct? Yes.
Good morning, Sergeant. How are you, sir? Good morning, sir. Good. Can you identify yourself by telling your first and last name to the court's reporter? My name is Sergeant Stephen Williams. Go ahead and spell how you spell Stephen. S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you do for a sir? I'm a sergeant uh, over the Dallas Police Department's body-worn camera and DVR. I am the administrator for the department in the operation of the body-worn cameras and in-car camera systems. And I want to talk to you a little bit about body-worn cameras. You and I have worked on many, many cases over the years. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. Okay. I appreciate uh, everything that you do for the department. Um, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, First of all, what is a body-worn camera, and, and what utility is that for your department? So the Dallas Police Department utilizes the Axon body-worn camera system. Basically, a body-worn camera system is a camera with a microphone that affixes to the officer's uniform and records the interactions that they encounter with citizens uh, or any actions that they are performing when they're performing law enforcement actions. So whenever they're doing their duties, uh, they're recording on their body-worn camera to record their actions. Uh, to provide transparency, accountability, record facts and details that they may not be able to recall, um, wide gamut of things of its purposes are for, for the officer and for the organization. Unlike police radios, uh, which are given to the officers that they can have 24 hours a day, does Dallas Police Department give officers body-worn cameras that they can have 24 hours a day? Officers are given or trained and issued body-worn cameras. Um, the operational usage for the body-worn cameras for the department are that they utilize them during their on-duty hours. So when they come to work, they use it and record the data that they encounter throughout their shift. And the conclusion or the end of their shift, on their way home, or not on their way home, when they exit the station, they place their camera in what's called the docking station. The docking station is where it then recharges and then offloads all of the evidentiary value to the cloud storage where the evidence is retained uh, for later use. So in the event of Ms. Geiger, for example, if Ms. Geiger was issued a body-worn camera by the Dallas Police Department, uh, she would undock it in the morning when she got to her police station, and at the conclusion of her day, she would redock it so that it could be charged for the next. Correct. Okay. Wouldn't go home with her typically, is that correct? Correct, would not go home typically. Now approach the witness, Your Honor. Yes. Sergeant, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification. This states exhibit number 24. This is a business records affidavit that you have attested to, which indicates the usage of Ms. Geiger's body-worn camera on September the 6th, 2018. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. All right. And are these records kept in the normal course of business for the Dallas Police Department? Yes, sir. Are these records accurate and reliable? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'm going to offer states exhibit number 24 for all purposes. These have been under business records affidavit proffered to the defense on May the 7th of 2019. And Judge, just so I can verify right quick. Sergeant Williams, do the records indicate that Ms. Geiger undocked her body-worn camera at 7.47 and 52 seconds in the morning on September 6, 2018? Yes, sir, it does. Right. And that she wore the camera throughout the day, or at least the camera was operational throughout the day, and that she docked the camera at 9.26 and 22 seconds on the evening of September 6, 2018. That is correct. And that the battery life on that camera was still at 63%. Correct. What kind of resolution is my speaker? What kind of resolution in September of 2018 were the Dallas Police Department body warrant members set to set to record at? At that time the resolution for the organization was set at 480. And if I were to go to Best Buy right now or Walmart and buy, I guess, just a commercially produced tele the television, what kind of resolution are we looking at for something I, just, I would buy at Walmart? You can go anywhere from 480, 720, 1080, all the way up to 4K. 4K. 
Yes, sir. How many iterations, how many generations of technology, if, if we're at 8K, 4K, 1080p, 7? Two to three generations. Multiple generations. Yes, sir. All right, so DPDs, at least when it comes to the quality of resolution for the videos of 2018, would you say that it wasn't, it wasn't as good as it could have been? Correct. And tell me how that affects the recording, especially when you're in motion. In motion, what it does is basically it's the number of pixels in the image in which it records. At 480, it's a limited number of pixels. Uh, when you increase the pixelation, you're able to capture more detail and finite. Um, it's just when you look at um, going from like regular radio over the air to digital radio. It's just the amount of information that's captured. At the time, the organization was only recording at 480. And if an officer is in motion, is the image going to seem blurry? Correct. It will seem blurry. Whereas with, so, really? Never seen Judge. I'm sorry, Mr. Hermes. Surrender the phone or are you going to exit? Thank you, Mr. Hermes. Please go ahead. So I think my question was, my last question was, so an officer in motion, the camera, based on its resolution at that time, is going to seem blurry? Yes, sir. Okay. Where are the body-worn cameras typically positioned in the body of the so according to policy and procedure for the organization, the cameras are have to be affixed above the officer's duty belt to attach to their uniform, um, in which they are able to see and capture. Um, part of their duties are to ensure that when they started their tour of duty, that when they affix their uniform, their camera to the uniform, they're able to see a clear image and that it records at an eye level um, from their chest uh, what they're seeing, that they have a clear image. So usually it's in the center or to the left of their chest that they affix the cameras to. So typically it's going to be lower than what they would be seeing with their eyes. Is Correct. Right? Okay. And um, is, is it fair, I want you to tell me if, if I've got this right or not, that the human eye picks up images much better than the camera, nevertheless the camera is a, a useful tool? Correct. Permission to approach on Yes, sir. Your Honor, does the court wish me to ask every time I approach or just? No, with each new witness. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, Sergeant, I'm going to show you what's remarked for identification of states exhibit number 7, number 9, number 26, and number 52. Are each of those going to be metadata that you have attested to by way of business records affidavit? for the body-worn cameras of Officer Wynn, N-G-U-Y-E-N, Officer Boudreau, B-E-A-U-D-R-E-A-U-L-T, <coughs> Officer Dugas, D-U-G-A-S, and Officer Lee, L-E-E. -E. Yes, sir, they are. Okay, and are these, the metadata <clears throat> is the is the data underlying the actual visual recording? Is yes, sir. Okay? Does it show for you and then for this jury what time, for example, a body-worn camera was activated? Correct, it does. Would it show what time a body-worn camera is deactivated? Yes, sir. Would it show how a body-worn camera is activated, either automatically or by the officer depressing the button? Correct, it does. Okay, and does it also show if the body-worn camera had been assigned to an individual user, that individual user's name? Yes, sir, it does. Dallas Police Department's body-worn cameras, I th I've heard, the rumor is at our request, doesn't have the date stamp and time stamp depicted on the recording itself because sometimes it covers Correct. something of evidentiary value. Correct. So, uh, unfortunately, it's not depicted on the image, so we have to use the metadata to understand what time these were. Yes, sir. Judge, I'm going to offer State's Exhibit 7, 9, 26, and 52 for all purposes. My business records affidavit. I'm not sure of the date, but Mr. Rogers is talking.
subject. They are each admitted, and we may publish them that jury leaves here. And Your Honor, just so the jury doesn't have, I see that they don't have much space to put stuff down. May I collect the Certainly. documents from them? And Your Honor, I'm going to go ahead and offer for record purposes on the State's Exhibit 4A. Any objections? No objection. 4A is admitted for record purposes. Um, Sergeant Williams, just I think just a couple other quick questions. Can you let the, the jury know? So, look, if we look at the volume one camera of metadata, it could indicate. Can I publish, Judge? Yes. Looking at the metadata, it would indicate that on the 6th of September 2018, his body worn camera was activated at 220206. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Okay. But the jury should know that when the actual video image that they're fixing to see here shortly pops up, that's actually 30 seconds before the start time. Correct, sir. So, would you explain to the jury? How it is that a camera actually has a recording of something before it actually is started? So the cameras are equipped with what we call a pre-event buffer. So basically what that means is that when the officer activates his body-worn camera, it's then going to go back 30 seconds prior to that activation and capture any video that was occurring prior to that. So it's in state always continuously recording the previous 30 seconds from whenever the officer activates his camera so that we always see what happened 30 seconds prior. In that 30 seconds prior, you will not have audio. You will only have video in the evidentiary video. And then at the actual start time, uh, where the officer depressed the button, you'll have both audio and video. Correct. Okay. Is this because in the event of an officer engaging his camera, he may be engaging his camera in response to something that happened seconds before? Yes, sir. So it's built in that when you depress it, it will flag 30 seconds back for a video recording. And then at the time of the depressing of the button, you'll have both audio and video. Yes, sir. I'll pass it with this. No questions. Ma'am, be excused. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Would you please state your full name for the court reporter? Michael Lee. Right, spell the last name for her, please. L E E. And introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. What do you do for a living, sir? Um, I am the neighborhood police officer for the Central Substation. The Dallas Police Department? Yes, sir. How long have you been a Dallas police officer? For six years. Right. And can you give the jury some sort of an idea of what it is that you do on a daily basis? I am more of a face of the police department. We do a lot of community service uh, projects. We do um, active shooter projects, and we do um, any type of fundraiser situations that will call for the police department to be a part of. Well, I want to take you right now to September the 6th of 2018. Were you on duty at 10 p.m. that evening? Yes, sir. Okay. And how were you assigned with the department at that time? At that time, I was on what they call a deep element initiative. I worked from 6 p.m., oh, well, weekdays, from 6 p.m. to um, 4 a.m. And from 6 to 10, I would be in patrol. And from 10 p.m. until 4, on weekdays, I would be in deep element only. And on weekends, from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. on weekends. Did you enjoy that assignment? I did. Okay, do you enjoy your assignment now? I do. 
Um, take us, were you with a partner that particular evening? Yes, sir. What was your partner's name? Uh, Kenan Blair. Okay, spell that for me. Uh, K-E-N-N-A-N-B-L-A-I-R. Did you end up responding to the Southside Flats on the uh, Signal 15 officer assist? I did. Where were, you, where were you and Officer Blair when that that call for service came out? We were just finishing up um, a loud noise complaint at the Lorenzo Hotel. Um, we was typing in comments, and we received the call. Okay. And how far away was that from the Southside Flats? Say the Lorenzo is maybe a mile, maybe two at the most. Not really far away. Okay, and did you and Officer Blair then respond to that location? Yes, sir. Were you in a squad car? Yes, sir. Do you remember who was driving? Uh, Blair, okay. Officer Blair. All right. And let me ask you this just before we get into it. Um, you have a take-home radio with the Dallas Police Department? Yes, sir. Um, if you needed to get in touch with the dispatcher because, say, for example, you came up on a, a burglar in a building or you walked into a building and you saw a burglar there and you were safely able to take a position of cover and concealment and you wanted help, would you use your radio or would you use your cell phone? I'll use my radio. Tell the jury why. Uh, it's quicker access. Uh, with the radio, you go straight from King up to uh, dispatch with 911. Call a 911, you have to get transfer to 911 and then the call is dispatched. So you rely upon your radio, and, and you know that if you call out on your radio, you're going to get help faster. Yes, sir. And when it comes to a signal 15, when an officer has indicated that they need assistance, either by way of radio or cell phone, smoke signals, whatever, the Dallas Police Department comes in mass, don't they? Yes, sir. That's a code 3 call. The Southside Flats is maybe two blocks away from Dallas Police Headquarters? Yes, sir. We have a number of officers always at Dallas Police Headquarters? Yes, sir. It's kind of like the, if the police department as itself was a body, the headquarters is like the heart, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So you're going to have a pretty good response time unless something extraordinary has happened. Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. Can you tell the jury what a Code 3 call is? Uh, code 3 is a license sirens. Uh, to get through traffic devices safely, uh, still stopping and yielding through traffic devices, but you're able to use your lights and sirens. Yes, sir. I think I came out to your station one day and we watched your body worn camera. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm showing you what's marked for identification as states exhibit number six. Uh, the recording that you saw of your body of your body worn camera that you were wearing that evening. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of what the body your body worn camera recorded? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it fair to say that a body worn camera can't capture everything that the human eye can? Correct. But it does capture what it captures, and that body-worn camera was on you. Yes, sir. Uh, for states exhibit number six. Okay. It's admitted. Can you make public return to Ms. Officer Lee, I'm going to publish this to the jury uninterrupted from the moment that you are driving up to the Southside Flats until you walk out of both John's apartment. Okay? Yes, sir. And then what we'll do is, so that way the jury gets a good look without being interrupted. Yes, sir. And then we're going to go over it again and just point out some things that I think are important. Okay? Yes, sir. And if you want, Officer Lee, you're more than welcome to look at any of these TVs, but you also have one right next to you. Just make yourself as comfortable as you want.
we start CPR.
Stop publication at 11 minutes and 29 seconds into the state's exhibit. <clears throat> All right. Officer Lee, first, let me just start with this. Did you recognize the officer that Officer Blair encountered in the hallway on this particular evening when you arrived? Yes, sir. Do you know that person to be Amber Geiger? Yes, sir. Do you see that person in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Would you please point to that person and tell me what that person is wearing? Uh, white sweater and um, dark dress, blouse. Let the record reflect that the witness is identified as a defendant in the court. <clears throat> At that particular time when you entered into uh, Mr. Jean's apartment, uh, did you see any signs of life from him? Let me not signs of life. He was alive, correct? Yes, sir. But was he responsive? Was he alert, conscious? No, sir. Okay. What did you and Officer Blair begin to do immediately? Uh, CPR, first aid. Is that how you're trained? Yes, sir. You, did you notice that, officer, or that uh, Mr. John was in apparent life and death crisis? Yes, sir. And once you and Officer Blair began the regimen of providing him aid, did you and your fellow officers stop for any reason? No, sir. You, as a matter of fact, you kept doing it, or actually Officer Blair started, and then you took over for Officer Blair, and then Officer Hamilton took over at some point for you both. Yes, sir. You gave him continuous 100% attention of your time to his needs. Yes, sir. After DFR arrived, did you see that they, they took over and also gave him continuous uninterrupted care. Yes, sir. As a citizen, would you expect anything less from our police officers? Yes, sir. Um, your body of worn camera, I believe, puts you at the scene at 22, or pardon me, it puts your, the start of your video recorder at 220206, 10206. Um, so you made it to the apartment complex rather quickly, right? Yes, sir. Um, you don't live at that apartment complex, do you? No, sir. Have you ever lived at that apartment complex? No, sir. Okay. You were able to make it, ha having never lived there, from entrance to that door in just a matter of a couple of minutes, your first time navigating through, is that right? It was, wasn't my first time there. Okay, you've been there before? Yes, sir. Okay. Did that help you get there somewhat quicker? Yes, sir. And that's entirely the point that I'm kind of stumbling to make. Someone who is not there, for example, any of the officers who are arriving who haven't ever lived there, or the firemen who, who are arriving who haven't lived there, that's going to take them more time than somebody that has lived there for months. Is that right? Yes, sir. you lived there for months, you would know how to navigate your apartment complex, presumably. Yes, sir. I'm going to object to reading. It's the same. I'll ask it like this. What would be the difference between a person who walks into an apartment complex for the very first time looking for an apartment versus someone who's gone to that apartment hundreds of times. Not knowing how to directly get there. And 
who would know how to get there? Someone who lived there. Can I approach the witness room? Yes. Officer Lee, I'm going to show you what's marked for identification as State's Exhibit Number 295, 296, 297, 298, 299, 300, 301, 302, and 303. These are going to be still photographs um, or still images from the body-worn camera with, that we just played for the jury, um, except that they have been lightened to show the couch, the seams on the couch. Would you look at those and tell me if they are fair and accurate depictions, except for being lightened from the actual recording? Yes, sir. And I've shown you these before. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. So for purposes not to depict lighting, because I have lightened these, do these show at least the crease on the couch and the proximity of what appears to be a bowl of food to the couch in yes. State's Exhibit Number 296? Yes, sir. Okay. And just... I don't suppose probably there would be any reason at all why you would remember this, but do you remember what was in that bowl that was next to his couch? No, sir. Okay, but do you see that it was there? Yes, sir. I'll offer states 295 to 303. <laughs> Judge, I'm going to object in that these photos have been altered by being lightened, and they don't—they uh, don't fairly and accurately depict uh, what was on the body camera. They've been altered, and we don't know what the, how they were altered, or what the lighting was added, and uh, therefore, uh, it's uh, not a proper predicate, and it's not relevant, and it's. Uh, subject to being misleading and confusing, and also it's more prejudicial and more probative. Mr. Herman, what was the basis or the reason why those photos were like? Judge, I was very, very clear with the court and with the jury, these are not being offered for to establish the lighting conditions because they have been light, they have been brightened. The purpose is to show certain images within those uh, screenshots, like the seam of the couch, so that you can see where the bowl of food is lined up with the crease of the couch, so you know what seat it's in front of and what seat it's not. It's not to depict the lighting conditions, but rather the proximate locations of the various items within the apartment at the time that Officer Lee went in. Because after Officer Lee and the fellow officers arrive, and there's a number of them in there, Items get moved because they're trying to give life-saving uh, assistance. Uh, you can see some of the movement of items. These will depict the location of certain things as best they existed at the time they entered. So the purpose of those photographs is to show the location of various items within the apartment uh, prior to the movement of the furniture or whatever item is depicted. Yes, ma'am. And by lightening them, for example, one of the things that it does on the on the couch, it will allow for the, the fact finder to see where the individual cushions are. And those photographs were taken from the video that we just viewed. Yes, ma'am. And Judge, I would just say that information can be gleaned from just straight still shots from the video without having a light that, 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 that alters and I don't know what lighting was added, or, or I can't cross-examine whoever lightened these and to what effect. I believe you just stated that lighting was not the issue. It's the placement and location of the items. So the court will allow uh, the admission of exhibits 295 through 303. And just for the record, Judge, uh, my objections on under uh, improper predicate and 401 and 403, are those overruled? Yes, they are. Commission of Public States Exhibit 296? Yes, sir. Okay. 
um, Officer Lee, by lightening up the photograph, again, just to make it abundantly clear, this photograph does not represent the lighting as it existed that you saw, correct, when you were inside the apartment? Yes, sir. That's correct. But for the purposes of showing where the seams are in the catch, here and over here, this bowl, whatever it is, since you don't recall what it contained, the original location as best as it was when you guys entered is that place, that bowl of ice cream, right around the middle section of that couch. Yes, sir. <coughs> All right, I'm going to republish. It's at number six. And this time I'm going to make I'm going to pause it at certain times so that we can discuss things. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Your Honor, for purposes of the record, I'm going to begin publication in about two minutes and seven seconds. It interstates at number six. Publication. My goodness, they can't make that any smaller. At two minutes and 30 seconds. Um, are you trained to make use of light? If light is to your advantage to use so that you can identify something, are you trained to use flashlight or available lighting so that you can see what you're encountering? Yes, sir. All right. What does Officer Blair utilize as soon as he makes entry into the complex from the stairs here? His weapon mounted light. Okay so that he can illuminate whatever he's going to be encountering? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Officer Blair uh, just apparently turned that light off. Is that right? Yes, sir. That presumably because he realizes he doesn't need it. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Officer Blair looking at something. Yes, sir. What, what are y'all looking at as you're going into the apartment complex there? Uh, apartment numbers. Okay, so were you able to establish where the apartment numbers are located and then from there try and find number 78, which is what y'all are looking for? Yes, sir. Right there, Officer Blair had his firearm in the low ready position, is that right? Saw it, yes sir. Okay, and then what did he do as soon as he, he turned that corner and he encountered an individual? He uh, remained at Sewell. Okay, and did he, or did he raise it and, and position it towards the person that was on the other end? After he cleared the corner, he, uh, he lowered it, yes sir. Okay, exactly, because he gave an opportunity to perceive what it is he was looking at. Object the leading inspector motions. Let me ask this. Did Officer Blair fire the second he saw somebody? No, sir. Okay. okay. I've stopped publication at three minutes and eight seconds. Are all of the lights in the hallway working? Yes, sir. Okay, and are there a number of lights in the hallway that are on right now? Yes, sir. 
And although it's blurry, can you see a red floor mat outside of parking 1478? Yes, sir. publication at 3 minutes and 20 seconds. What is the condition of the ironing board at the time that you guys make entry? It's upright. Okay, and does it appear to be cantered out into the living room area? Yes, sir. Okay, and what is the condition of the stool uh, behind that? It's upright as well. Okay, those, are, those are going to get moved by officers later on as they're trying to save this guy, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, I do, I, I do now. I do just, uh, okay, I just at the time, it. you didn't know what kind of food it was. No, sir. Yeah, I don't want you to tell what you learned so after. Four thirty, start CPR. Okay, I've stopped publication at three minutes and fifty-four seconds. Was there also a laptop computer on that ottoman next to or very close to the bowl of food? Yes, sir. Was that laptop on? Yes, sir. Was it emitting light? Yes, sir. publication at four minutes and ten seconds. Does this appear to be what's commonly referred to as a big screen TV? Yes, sir. Is the TV on? Yes, sir. Is the TV emitting light? Yes, sir. Is the TV emitting light directly at the couch? Yes, sir. Can you actually see a reflection in the couch that appears to be the same color as what the TV is emitting? Yes, sir. Officer Blair positioned with respect to Mr. John, who is lying right here. Um, he's on his knees. Okay. On the right side of him. Okay, so he's to the side of Mr. John. Yes, sir. When you take over for Officer Blair, uh, does Officer Blair then take a position behind um, Mr. John's head and you begin the performance of CPR on Mr. John? Yes, sir. Are you surprised? Or would you be surprised if this ottoman had been pushed back to allow for the repositioning of the number of officers coming into the room? No, sir, I wouldn't be surprised. <coughs> what is this item down here on the floor uh, next to Mr. John's head? Uh, earbud. Uh, air, uh, earbud, yeah. Okay. So it's very possible that Mr. John could have been wearing earbuds or earbuds in his ear 
that have fallen out because of his laying on the floor. Is that accurate? Is that possible? Yes, sir. Stop publication at five minutes and nineteen. Do you recognize who this officer is? Yes, sir. Who, what's his name? Uh, that's either Lopez or uh, uh, what is his name? Ah, okay, uh, his name. It doesn't matter for our purposes right here, but that is a Dallas police officer, right? Yes, sir. Again, is he going to move this ironing board again to make room for for folks who need to help, Mr. John? Yes, sir. And you can watch this stool in the background. What happened to the stool and the positioning of the ironing board? Yes, sir. What happened? It pushed to the far corner. Okay. All right. When, when you guys come to a scene, and again, you have to provide emergency life saving measures, is it really of paramount importance to you guys uh, if, if furniture or items need to be moved so that you can save a man's life? Is that what you're going to do? Yes, sir. Okay, but it's important, and that's your body worn camera would document that, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. By the way, in addition to the visual things that you noticed inside Mr. John's apartment, did you sense anything else? Like, for example, did it have any kind of a unique smell that you identified? Yes, sir. What, what did it smell like? It smelled like marijuana. Okay. Um, can you just give the jury an idea? What, what was the condition? I know you're not a doctor, but you're looking at a man. Um, do you believe that he's actually physically alive at the moment in time that you come in? Yes, sir. Um, What's he doing? What, show officer, me, tell me how he's presenting to you. So you have uh, Officer Blair who uh, checked his pulse and stated that he had a faint uh, pulse. Okay. And so off that information, uh, we assume that he, he was um, currently still alive. Uh, did he uh, ever give you any kind of responses to any of your verbal questions that you asked or anything like that? No, sir. Did he ever open his eyes or did he ever try and communicate with you in any way? No, sir. Would you regard his level of consciousness to be unresponsive in that sense? Yes, sir. Did you notice any kind of injuries or, um, now obviously with that, Miss Geiger, when she was, when you had the initial encounter with Miss Geiger, did she appear to be injured in any way? No, sir. Okay. Um, this particular location, the Southside Flats, where Mr. Jean was located. Uh, was that located in Dallas County, Texas? Yes, sir. Was this on September the 6th, 2018? Yes, sir. Was it apparent that Mr. Jean had been shot with a gun? Yes, sir. Is a gun a firearm? Yes, sir. Is a firearm a deadly weapon? Yes, sir. Oh, and one other thing too, Officer Lee, there was a female paramedic that came in with part of the uh, DFR crew that responded to the scene, correct? Yes, sir. And she wears her hair very much like the defendant does, kind of tightly put up in, into like a bun on the top. Yes, sir. Uh, just for clarification, we do see a female with hair that's put up in a bun who climbs up on top of the gurney and is giving Mr. Uh, Jean life-saving CPR efforts. Is that right? Yes, sir. Is that the defendant doing that or is that somebody else? No, sir. That was DFR. Okay. Have you ever had an occasion where you had to arrest somebody? Judge, that's all I had as far as publication if you're on the lights. 
Have you ever had a case where you've had to arrest somebody and take them to police headquarters? Yes, sir. And when you are, if there's a number of officers involved in that, you have to sit on them while detectives talk to them. Now, what is it that you guys do uh, there in the hallway or in the, the headquarters complex while you're waiting for detectives? Uh, paperwork, book in sheets, um, or start on the report, the preliminary of the report. And when, if the detectives are going to take a long time to get all your paperwork done, what do you do then? Sit and wait. Is there anything that that's like manually or physically exerting us in, in doing that? No, sir. All right. If you have your phone, can you kind of play on your phone or read texts? Yes, sir. Uh, is there a break area, bathroom facilities, kitchen facilities? Yes, sir. Can you eat if you want? Yes, sir. If your battery is run down uh, on one of the detectives' desks throughout the building, can you find a charger to charge your radio? Yes, sir. Do you think that'd be a problem at all? No, sir. Is it? Is it just basically being there in case something happens? Yes, sir. In your years with the Dallas Police Department, have you had to work long hours? Yes, sir. Who is the only person that can know your state of mind or physical condition? My Objective. Well, we'll try. If you feel that you are incapable of performing your duties safely for either yourself or for the <clears throat> citizens of Dallas, can you ask to be relieved so that you can take care of yourself? Yes, sir. If you're sick, can you call in sick? Yes, sir. Have you had occasions ever to respond to a like an open door or a burglary in progress? Yes, sir. Okay. And I understand, officer, what I'll just say as, as a statement of, I guess, introduction. There's a million possible variants that, that you may encounter on duty, you know, for even a burglar in a building call, okay? But whether you have not yet made entry, well, let's just start with that. If you have not yet made entry, what do your general orders and your training tell you to do? Should you enter that building alone? No, sir. Should you take a position of cover and concealment? Yes, sir. Why? Uh, for safety, officer safety. Um, you would need an additional officer for yourself. Okay. Primarily for whose safety? Uh, myself and the person inside, if okay. possible. And if you have, say you got there and there's an open door, you've opened up the door or you've looked inside and then you come to realize there is somebody inside that particular location. And you have two choices for this hypothetical. I want you to presume that you can safely tactically reposition to a position of cover and concealment. Okay, you have, let's say that you have that option. Okay. Or you can just shoot them dead and then figure it out later. What do you do? You cover and concealment. Is that because of the sanctity of human life? Yes, sir. If you are, if you can safely retreat to a position of cover and concealment and get backup, do you think that, that would be better or worse for your safety or for the safety of the person inside? Better. Have you ever lived in an apartment? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know that sometimes, I mean, you, let me ask you this. Who, who can go into your apartment and you may not even know? Maintenance. Maybe there's an emergency or something inside your apartment, right? Yes, sir. When you sign a lease or when you go into an apartment, you kind of recognize that that's a possibility. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Do emergencies only happen in the daytime? No, sir. Okay. Let me ask you this question as well. If there was somebody, whether it be a complete stranger, or whether, like, like a citizen, let's say the citizen was actually the burglar, uh, or whether that person was in your own home. If that person would surrender, would you allow that person the opportunity to surrender without killing? Yes, sir. I'll pass it, please. Officer Lee. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Robert Rogers. We met before, correct? Yes, sir. Um, on September 6, 2018, um, you were at the, uh, at the Lorenzo Hotel? Yes, sir. And you got the call, and you and Officer Blair were the first responding officers, correct? Yes, sir. Um, Y'all riding a two-man, do you always ride a two-man on your assignments? Yes, sir. Um, now, uh, Officer Blair has a mounted light on his gun. Do you have a mounted light on your gun? No, sir. Um, DPD doesn't issue mounted lights on guns, correct? Correct. If you want one, you have to get your own and put it on yourself, correct? And qualify, yes, sir. And qualify with the mounted light on your gun. Yes, sir. Um, and so when y'all are responding, it's confusing because the, the layout of the apartment is confusing. Had you ever been to the Southside Flats before? Yes, sir. Um, was it one or several occasions, or do you recall? Been there several times. Um, do you recall that the, the hallways smell like marijuana? If any time I've been there, have it ever smelled yes. like marijuana? Yes, sir. It has. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean every tenant is smoking marijuana, but someone in the hallway could be smoking marijuana and that can uh, lead to the odor going down the hallway, correct? Yes, sir. Um, with uh, when, when you finally got to the fourth floor, um, you had to run up some stairs. You know, the wall, your conditioning's good. Is that correct? It's okay. All right. And so you uh, are following Officer Blair. When you're running through the, uh, you know, you're moving quickly down the hallway, uh, you know, numbers in apartment complexes are always different. And even though you've been there before, um, is it fair to say that those numbers are harder to see than normal apartment complexes. Yes, sir. Uh, they're in white light on a white background, and they're up and to the left of doors instead of being clearly marked on the door, correct? Yes, sir. And so Officer Blair had to stop and look up uh, because he didn't, he, he didn't know what the apartment numbers were, and he wasn't sure of where he was going, correct? Correct. Um, and y'all were Basically, is it fair to say you're, you're looking for a noise or something to get you into the right place? Yes, sir. Um, because you don't know the numbers, you don't know the layout, it's hard to see as, you, um, um, as you're just running down there. So you're, you're moving as quickly as you can and trying to figure out this confusing situation and the best way to get you in the right place is, is for someone to call out or notify where they are, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, when Officer Blair comes around the corner and he draws his weapon, when you're going there, you know that there has been a shooting, correct? Yes, sir. And so does that place you on high alert that there's a lot of unknown variables and you don't know all the details of how the shooting occurred, you just know there's a shooting, there's an officer involved somehow, you don't know how the officer is involved. So you're on high alert that that someone with a gun could be around any corner, correct? Yes, sir. And so that, uh, when, when Officer Blair comes around the corner and he hears something, he's not going to wait to see who it is. He's going to draw his weapon and assess who, as he's figuring out whether his life is in danger, correct? Yes, sir. And down the clearly lit hallway, it's fair to say he saw a fully dressed, uh, in their uniform, Dallas police officer saying, over here, over here, correct? Yes, sir. And that clearly does not present a threat, does it? No, sir. And so he put his weapon down and continued down the hallway, and it was Amber Geiger who was out there in the hallway, correct? Yes, sir. And she directed you to the apartment, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and then, what was her demeanor like? She was, she got there? Uh, she was upset. 
Um, how would you, uh, what's, was it slightly upset, or how would you describe her overall, uh, well, let me put it this way. You, you've met Amber Geiger before, correct? Yes, sir. Y'all were in the same academy class. Yes, sir. And so, was her demeanor uh, um, a lot different than you've seen her ever? Yes, sir. I uh, Describe that. Um, her demeanor. Very emotional. Um, and so, your focus immediately becomes on uh, Mr. John, who's who's. There's there's no mystery here. Uh, when you're when you're walking in, she's telling you she thought she was in her own apartment. Um, basically, it means to you she shot a man in in his apartment, correct? Yes, sir. And she's uh, in. She's panicking. She's distraught. And you, uh, you get her to clear the way so you can address Mr. John, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and she does that. She, she gets out of the way in your direction, correct? Yes, sir. And you know she's involved and for the integrity of the scene. It's best to get the involved officer away from the scene, correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Um, with um, Officer Blair... Uh, starts doing CPR, um, and then you take over, correct? Yes, sir. You have gloves on, and you do CPR for a significant amount of time, correct? Yes, sir. And where are you, when you're doing CPR, where do you focus on on the body? I'm on his uh, breast chest plate. So, <clears throat> right there, the sternum? Yes, sir. And the wound on Mr. John was an upper left wound, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, so when you were doing CPR, you didn't get blood on your hands, did you? No, sir. Um, in fact, we see you in the video. Um, uh, at about 9:19, you're once you're done doing, you know, Officer Hamilton, or I think takes over and starts doing CPR. Um, you start trying to. You're you're going. In, you're still in patrol mode. You start uh, trying to identify who this person is. So we see you pull out his driver's license, correct? Yes, sir. And then you're calling, using your radio to call the identifiers on the driver's license, correct? Yes, sir. And these are the same gloves that you just used to do CPR, correct? Yes, sir. And so there was no blood on the driver's license and there was no blood on your radio, correct? Correct. Um, and if there had been blood, there, there's a procedure that you go through when you do come into contact or close come into contact uh, for a blood exposure, correct? Yes, sir. And you didn't have to do that, correct? No, sir. When, um, With regard to the AirPods, did you did you notice that when you were there, or did you not later notice it on the body cam? I uh, noticed it later on the body cam. Um, even though your, your body cam captured it, was it fair to say that you once you went in that apartment, you had tunnel vision on uh, Mr. John and, and and trying to assist him? Yes, I was I was paying more attention to him. Right. Um, and sometimes you miss things that might be right there, but because you're so focused on one thing, you don't see other things, correct? That's possible, yes, sir. Um, and you've been in intense situations as a police officer, correct? Yes, sir. You've been in situations where um, a su suspect posed a threat, correct? Correct. Um, and in your experience, are you hyper-focused on the suspect and what about the suspect are you most concerned about? Uh, his hands, his, his or her hands. Why is that? Uh, those are the, the items that can hold items that can cause you bodily damage. Or and, and when there's, based on the context of the situation and the uncertainty of, of how a suspect is uh, acting, if you don't see the hands, then uh, there's a real threat, possible deadly threat, correct? Can you repeat that again? I'm when, sorry. Depending, when, uh, the context, depending on the context of the situation, 
if you are uh, confronting a suspect that presents that you perceive is a threat, uh, is it important for you to figure out where the hands are and what whether or not they're holding something? Yes, sir, it is. Um, so when you you're on duty um, at the time this call comes in, correct? Yes, sir. And your uh, the the call at your Lorenzo Hotel was it significant? Was there anything uh, intense about it? No, sir. You recall? Okay, so you go from in, in patrol. Uh, you can go from call to call to call. Some can be uh, mundane. Some can be just disputes and you never know when the intensity is going to ratchet up in a, in a millisecond, correct? Yes, sir, you're correct. So, so even though the day might be boring or even though you might not get into a chase or anything, significant confrontations, uh, you're, you're on high alert the whole time uh, just based on the nature of the job, correct? Yes, sir. Um, when you're off duty, um, there, uh, uh, let me, let me, when you got this call, you had certain details that you knew going in, which, what you might be dealing with, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. And so you you and Officer Blair, I go work together on numerous occasions. Yes, sir. And sometimes with new partners, you have to talk to each other and say, okay, when we get there, do this or that. And sometimes... Uh, with like you and Officer Blair, you don't have to do a lot of talking going in. You both know that each person is going to handle it uh, and respond to whatever they need at that location, correct? Yes, sir. Um, so you're formulating uh, kind of a plan to deal with possibly an active shooter, correct? Yes, sir. Um, and so that puts you in a mindset where you're more aware of potential danger, correct? Yes, sir. Um, when um, when you get a burglary call, uh, you know that there's something has initiated a warning to you that there is a uh, potential burglar in a location, correct? Yes, sir. And so you have a plan formulated before you even get to that address or that business location about how you're going to deal with the situation. Yes, sir. And so if you get to that location and there's an open door, you're already prepared for that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, you're not going to immediately run in because you know going in it's a burglary call, correct? Correct. Um, and when uh, you go into your own house, if you were confronted with an intruder, with someone that you firmly believed had broken into your house, and it was dark, uh, would you treat it like a burglary call? You don't have time to plan for that, do you? No, sir. Uh, you have to deal with the person that's inside your home that you believe has broken into it, correct? Correct. And if that person presented a deadly threat to you, would you uh, be prepared to use deadly force? A deadly threat, yes, sir. Uh, if you felt your life was in danger uh, and you were in your own home confronting a burglar that you believe was threatening you with deadly, with your life, you would be prepared to use deadly force, correct? With deadly force, yes, sir. Um, In your experience in apartment complexes, did maintenance men ever rummage through your apartment in the in late at night and not turn on the lights when they're when they're handling something? No, sir. I'll pass the witness. Or nothing else. May be excused. No judgment from the state. Just subject to recall. Officer, please make yourself available to shoot you be recalled to testify. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our morning break. We're going to start back at 10.40. All right.